is a pleasure to be with you. Actually, I was also encouraged by the fact that uh, I was likely to meet a, virtually a good many people that we have been together since our time preparing for the Stockholm conference. Um, I have been on that journey as a government representative, as a diplomat, as a, a UN uh, official for several decades, and uh, as the executive governor has just mentioned, uh, 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 a representative of ISL. As I speak, I have been in long association on environment and UNEP, but I'm not speaking for UNEP. I retired 18 and a half years ago after working in the organization for approximately 30 years. And, uh, uh, you know, from government to UN and to NGO ISO, uh, that has been my mission with a stint of nine years uh, in the judiciary of the Republic of Kenya as a judge level appointment in environmental law. So we've been uh, wrong on this particular topic. I think our journey begins uh, 50 years ago, I was just um, actually more than that. Uh, and uh, uh, the preparation for the Stockholm is really the focus that uh, takes us this, this far. As uh, has been said again and again, the, we didn't formally go into environmental law learning. We couldn't, it wasn't there. I got my public law education courtesy Professor Ian Brownlee of Oxford and his early book on principles of public law. We were the testing board, so to speak. And so we liked it, we liked that, but in that teaching, there was no reference to anything called environmental law whatsoever. And in fact, in his subsequent uh, editions of that uh, work, it's only uh, on eighth or seventh or the edition that you see uh, a few pages on environment and natural resources, not environmental law as such. So, as even as I proceed, let me pay, pay tribute to uh, experts and uh, professors, uh, scholars of, uh, uh, who persisted in pushing along environmental law. And by me is one of them, one of the best, one of the strongest, one of the most experienced, one who has encouraged me while working as a diplomat, while in uh, UNEP, where we have been together. I think we need uh, those of you who are here to give a clap to all those that are actual scholars whose mission has connected a vacant, a vacuum past with the future, the young ones that we have seen today. Shall we give them a clap just for the sake of it? So just you know, it's, it's good to acknowledge somebody when he hears and when he leaves, rather than the glory we give them when they are departed. So that is one point I wanted to make. And I once want to uh, uh, pay tribute to those that shared with me that we shared a lot and moved along. And in the audience, there are several of those that have been very surprised to see. I actually uh, got to come here because I knew I would connect with them. But now, of course, those that are out there can connect with the voice. Peace within nature and 
nature in peace. These concepts have been discussed the whole day, the whole morning. And so I think I can quickly uh, bypass that and go to the uh, question of uh, environmental law and the needs of uh, the seeds of environmental law planted in the Stockholm conference. You had outcomes in uh, Stockholm, 109 recommendations, one, a declaration, the Stockholm Declaration of 26 Principles, and later on, 20 years later in Rio, you got another 27 principles, you well connected there. You had a proposal of a structure uh, that comprised uh, the, uh, the secretariat, a small secretariat that was to be established, uh, headed by an executive director. You had a governing council of 58 to, for policy, and you had uh, a, a, an environment coordination board, which has gone on to into environmental management group, and of course, an environmental fund to service that particular institution when it came to pass. And the, those recommendations were wrapped up in a resolution 2997 of the 27th session of the General Assembly, unanimously adopted on the 15th December, 1972. Now, if, as I go into the actions taken because a new organization without a chart directing where it should go, not laid out, no example to follow because the, uh, the nearer organization that had been established, which you all are aware of, is you, was UNIDO. And uh, you, know, you know its fate thereafter to date. So there wasn't really clear ground to go to and the specialized agencies were old, already sufficiently old. Let me say more is strong. The executive director for three years, the first three years and his deputy, Mustafa Kamal Torba for 33 years as deputy and 17 years as executive director. They led a vigorous uh, endeavor to put in place and to have accepted the new organization. You see, the, that was a team from the head from the, the, the north, the deputy from the south. And thereafter, you can see we have had seven executive directors with the current one, Inga Anderson, a lady heading the organization at the close of 50 years and at the beginning of the next 50 years. And her deputy is Joyce Musuya, a lady from the South. So you already see the males more or less giving way for that other gender, which in globally is most in touch with, with environmental construction and development. So it is a well orchestrated situation there. You see the other, uh, uh, now that I mentioned executive directors, there have been seven, those the first ones 20 years, the next group to have been uh, there long enough were uh, uh, number of, uh, it was Akim Steiner and Klaus Tolfer, both did 18 years, so fairly close. And they were assisted by a group of deputies and Musuya, the one there now, is the 13th deputy executive director uh, of, 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 of UNEP. So the, let's focus on, you see, on 
what was done. It established as a catalytic organization that was not convincing to developing countries. They wanted action out there in their place and to be connected so that their future is better secured, not uh, uh, spoiled by pollution and other considerations. And, and so movement toward the, that action was very clear. And of course, you know, there were issues, but let me mention a number of these quickly. You have the, the action plan, as I said, an action already in the programs came about. In fact, the first program in the approved decision 1-1 of June 1973 in Geneva, the first regular session was human settlements. That is already a program, UN Habitat. So that was out of the way and the urban environment is cared in that direction. But the others, Earthwatch, assessment, that structure, and money, environmental management, and support measures, those came in. And in no time, there was distinction in assessment, distinction in regional seas, a string of them, you know, about uh, 14 of them covering a range of 140 governments within no time. So as the oceans issues were discussed beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, you had these other situation where the nearer coast was the focus of the new entity and institution and Peter Thatcher, uh, Stefan Keshkesh, all these people were on the thick of it, so to speak, to get that going. And then environmental law emerged because as I say, it has to be action and it was actioned with the vigor and the developing countries called for technical assistance on a request, not imposed on them, on their request to be assisted, to move on, to consolidate uh, things. And you know, the, you know, in Agenda 21, that comes as capacity building, a fact of major con consequence. So you have these as the flagship programs of UNEP for quite a number of years. And uh, it is something worth mentioning right at this point. Then you have UNEP as the center of consultation and critical elaboration of a translation of the pioneering soft law in the Stockholm principles and later on in the Rio principles to anchor and father and mother the, 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 the principles into a soft instrument into firm binding law. And that we are know of now with the, the number of agreements and the, 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 uh, the um, continuing mechanisms in the conference of the parties in the global and regional activities that were undertaken. I want to emphasize that it's not only environmental law because I mentioned capacity building and that meant we had to go out into a national level to have firm national legislation from constitutions, statutes and regulations. Different three program areas evolved soft law but principles, guidelines in areas which could not rapidly move there and then into binding law. But sooner than later, they were in that process. So you will see that from either Aarhus, 
Expo Convention uh, in Europe and other 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 the regional instruments. So so you see that coming up and having started ad hoc because we had not a structured way of moving in from 1973 to 1980, you had uh, uh, that ad hoc cohesion, and I will mention on my uh, fifth point about CITES and uh, other, uh, other aspects begun by IUCN and taken over with the, this other organization. Let me say from then 1980, the move came up where we need a systematic development. And then the flagship Montevideo program, 10 years was initiated. I had the privilege of meeting the father who invited that group to Uruguay, Montevideo in 1981. My, my Excellency, uh, Margarinos Di Mero, who I, I met in Stockholm, or he was ambassador of Stockholm in 1970, and we flagged on thereafter for many years. When he was president of the governing council, I would be his assistant in, in some of these aspects, preparing his notes for the governing council. The fourth point I want to just underline quickly is from the beginning, UNEP and IUCN were hand and, and glove in the joint work in policy, in science, in financing, and in, in, in the conclusion of both global conventions and regional ones. The World Conservation Strategy, you recall, 1980, was a joint activity with the two, I said at that point in time was handicapped with the resources and UNEP provided for that. I was uh, uh, chief of program coordination and uh, connected readily and easily and firmly over this stretch of time in that particular area. And it became a way of life as a matter of interest. I might, might mention that uh, you, it was uh, uh, my moderator that uh, UNEP provided uh, directors general and the presidents of uh, assemblies of IUCN to IUCN. You remember Dave Monroe, you remember Gennady Gorbev, but and you remember Casas, Casas and uh, even Ashok course, uh, just the other day, and uh, uh, Martin Holgate there. But now, what has happened lately? It is IUCN that has provided executive heads to UNEP. She's, uh, the synergy <laughs> is remarkable. Two executive heads have come from IUCN, Director General Akim Steiner, and, <laughs> and, and Inga Anderson. So you see, we, we, we have had this and working together is a shoe in, is a win-win situation because where ICN is a NGO, UNEP is IGO and therefore work from the NGO, work together is then picked and it proceeds. And on uh, the fifth point I want to also stress is that you have CITES in Washington Convention in 1973 being assigned to UNEP to carry out implementation. You have this. So, so you, you can see what, and it was followed quickly by the Convention on Migratory Species and uh, other conventions, the trans Basel Convention on uh, Movement of Wastes. And, and in, in 1989, in 1985, you have the protection of the ozone layer. It's a Montreal Protocol and all these 
within now falling squarely or within the framework of the Montevideo program, as I said, now on its uh, fifth, fifth, uh, fifth, fifth years we are talking about. So you have this. By the time I mentioned the, uh, the software instrument point number six, you on the increase. Every, everywhere and uh, increasingly binding, not anymore, uh, just uh, a soft law. You have, you have a readiness to accept the principles that are already concluded, not in binding law, but a great investment on the part of states and diplomats to have them on. And this country, France already, you know, moving in the direction of taking on those principles that are not already in binding law, the ones that have been merged in the meantime to be bound in this kind of situation now in a global convention for the protection of the environment. And its initiative of several experts, I was there in Paris in, uh, in, in, in 2017, you are there, you remember. Then this General Assembly, the second and 73rd have the process on with the structure uh, moving from New York to Nairobi and ongoing there. So you, you have this kind of connection uh, that you should be appreciated. And the seventh point that I would like to underline of policy making and the developments within this organization, the, you will see the governing council of 58 member states that came on approving these and these moving on and itself being restructured to strengthen its governance and working with the governments and IGOs and NGOs, particularly those that are science oriented, those that have environmental concerns like the ICUN, like ICSU, like all these, these others. And you see, you see the, uh, that at this point in time, you have you, 30, you had 27 governing council sessions. Wolfgang Buhene and myself attended the most of those. I was, of course, uh, uh, you know, you were in the government attending the governing council uh, already after, from the first one in June 1973, where I would be loaned by Kenya to Jamaica as chairman of group of 77 to assist in that kind of process. You see how flexible the developing world uh, and China were. They, you know, you say you Kenyan, you, you are the assisting the Jamaican ambassador to get the, the, the process going. Then it moved, uh, you had 27 sessions, a universal session. You had 12 special sessions with Wolfgang and our alternate who, who attends more than the other. I attended all 27 regular sessions, one universal session, five uh, UNEA sessions, now of 1993, and I missed the four special sessions that were held out there. Wolfgang would cover them. And uh, I covered the UNEA when he was not able to come and, and so on. So you see how the policy side had to come along. Nobody at this time doubts the possibility, the power and the, 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 and, and the position of UNEP in handling environmental law, both international regional or even at, at the local level in the capacity building. But of course, UNEP itself is not ex 
exclusive, is not the only, only one that is in, in responsible of this area. We know the General Assembly has responsibility, other the specialized agencies and so on. They never, we ne at least we never claimed exclusive responsibility. No, it's a job to be done. And we, so long as you are coordinate, you are proper, you are using the resources well, the job is being done, not who is doing necessarily. That's not, was not the point. And partnership, easier done, easier mentioned than done was quite a challenge. And let me say about the nine, 10 uh, leaders of environmental law in, in UNEP from about eight, nine countries you know, you would know them, colleagues. And, uh, you know, Masa Nagai uh, from uh, Japan holding onto the chemical side so that uh, they were connected strongly and so on under the authority of the directors that were there. And I was uh, trying to figure out, I remember 73, it, 74, it was the Ibrahim of the Sudan who was there. And they are, I'm sure you would know the others. Thereafter, it was Tabman, then Mensa and Boateng, then Peter Sand, uh, whom you know, a good friend and colleague, uh, Romel Bolska from Poland, Sun Lin, I was uh, there. Uh, uh, and uh, Elizabeth Murema, now came okay, by one of my senior staff in the organization in my time, now Assistant Secretary General in Montreal, and whom we are relating with and connecting very strongly. And right at this point, you have uh, Professor Kameri Bote, whom we all know also coming from that. Let me mention on point number nine, the um, where a, a national side of things, because if you only mention the international and we have the list and uh, many conventions and so on, you would say, well, how you, how come? But uh, the national side, you know, at uh, Stockholm, the national reports were eight, something 86 or so, and they touched vaguely on uh, concepts of policy a piece of legislation here and there, not well conceived to cover the environmental challenge that was there then. What do you have now? You, if you, there is any country which doesn't have a body of national environmental law, it would be one probably or two. It's not questioned. It is the way of life. Interestingly, in the earlier discussions, the question of saying that the, there was lack of implementation of law is not only environmental law, it is every law. That's why you have criminals in jails. They have not respected the law. So <laughs> it's a challenge, but uh, this one has emerged and has conquered and mastered the situation. In my view, the environmental law policy and mission has been a great success. And I would like, well, you know, I am, I am neighbored by an authority in this area. If I have misunderstood that the first 50 years have done that much, you have within the United Nations system, outside the UN with partners and governments, and then looking forward to enhanced more and better implementation at the global and regional level and as well at national level where you as taxpayer have pressure on the government to do what it has promised the political parties to do and the next future. What are we talking about? We are talking of a future where environment is a heavy load and responsibility of a number of players and environment and climate issues. You have sustainable development evolving and being uh, put in place 
to make sure the future is not threatened. I have more past, but I'm glad to see in the audience and listening, there are those with more future. So improve on our weaknesses, make it good. And we will only applaud, applaud you because you are our children, our grandchildren. That is where we are going. It's not where we are coming from. So you have that. And then you have issues of capacity build, science and technology, the oceans of which I was one of the people involved heavily before going into the secretariat is we put our promise common heritage benefits and so on. They are on their way still. We did it. We were patient. We are patient. And so if you have more future, just follow, follow closely because these are benefits that were promised that we have not grasped as yet. So uh, the conservation of nature is another one. What is missing? Funds will be needed. More implementation, that's quite clear. Therefore, are we, there are, are challenges over? Of course not. So long as there is humanity, challenges are part of the process of life. So let's uh, now look at the uh, an aspect of national law. They, if we said it's predominant, it is there. But Professor here knows, and we have been together on that, the legislature, the executive were ahead. The judiciary was missing. And we knew and we reasoned and argued, if these are not brought on the board and one convention or more are thrown out as unlawful, illegal, and so on, and therefore null and void, we would get a setback of, of untold proportions. So we said, let's, let's bring them on board. Let's bring them on board. We started in, in, in Africa with a few countries and very cautiously. And what happened? It was successful. When it succeeded, we went out. And uh, with the professor here, we were in Colombo for South Asia. We went to Manila, that was 97, 1999. We then moved on in the Caribbean and uh, Mexico. We, 2002, the Global Symposium, we were there. And with 125 chief justices and senior judges, things were moving. Things moved. After the World Summit for Sustainable Development there in, in Johannesburg, 30 years after Stockholm, Nick took responsibility, you know, as IUCN. In, where did we have the next meeting in September 2002? In London, in London, hosted by the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales and all these European nations. We were there opening style. And we thought that that's not, this was not the region where there was anxiety on that subject. But what did we get? It was that. Uh, and Nick, 2003, Kiev for Eastern Europe. 2003, Kuwait for the Arab uh, group. And the matter now, I can say that the, the, the third arm of government is properly informed. And uh, the law, the rulings by those courts earlier on, we are looking to the north. 
now in from uh, uh, India, Pakistan, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, Manila, all these, Australia itself has this and, and, and elsewhere, we are on board. So it's a question of consolidation. Let me briefly then talk about my story. You told about your stories. I want to tell my story, one of, uh, one of mine, and the, it is based on the location of UNEP in the global south, in the developing world, and in Kenya. All the is other issues were relatively easily agreed when the, the political side of East-West, the German and so on, were sorted out. And in Stockholm, the offers were, were made by states. Let me tell you, the argument of the developed world at the time was clear. Environment not being substantive but catalytic should be where the other agencies of the UN were. That was the argument that was put forward. And London, United Kingdom, of made a very good offer. This nation wanted the new organization to be located in Monaco. And Netherlands wanted it in Europe. Austria wanted it in Vienna. So the Scandinavian countries wanted this, this in, 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 in Europe. And Eastern European countries were quite happy that that was there. Then Mexico wanted it in Mexico. And you know, Malta wanted it this side. And uh, uh, in Asia wanted, in India wanted it in New Delhi. Africa had the four of us, Lagos for Nigeria, Kinshasa in Zaire, uh, Kampala in Uganda, and Nairobi, Kenya. Ambassador, uh, the ambassador of Kenya, Derojo, uh, asked, where, where, why don't you give me a draft where we, how do we handle this? And uh, we, I, we put a draft which then had to be considered the African group and so on. A draft was quite simple draft. It said, considering all other headquarters are in Western Europe and North America, considering new ones should be distributed, go also to other areas which didn't have them, decides to locate the new secretariat in a developing country. He stopped at that point. And of course, uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, South, if we agreed in a developing country, it was a nice strategy. Then both North America and, and Western Europe would be excluded while we talked. And in Africa, Kenya was supported by the other three countries. All right, Mexico before long also stepped down. Now you can see how it was going. It's a question of uh, Kenya, Nairobi and New Delhi. At this point, the developed country said, no, we have no financial implications on this draft. Therefore, uh, we defer the decision from the 27th session to a subsequent session. What? He said, no. I sitting behind the ambassador, I said, Mr. Balozi, ambassador, ask a question. Did the secretary general take seriously Kenya's offer to locate the secretariat in Nairobi? It was made in June. How come? There are no financial implications an ambassador ranking of Canada who was chairing the second committee said, all right, three o'clock, when we meet a representative of the secretary general to give the reason why there are no implications. Three o'clock, sharp, question, you know, yeah, first speaker, you know, you, you know the question of, of the, of uh, the, 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 the first speaker, representative of the Secretary General. What happened? 
and there was no explanation offered by the office of the secretary general what was done is that the secretary general is sending a two man team to nairobi so he's asking for adjournment for two weeks for the consideration of the item and is that the case you know there was no objection that was the case that afternoon this speaker was shipped to Nairobi to go and prepare for the mission of Albert Kazum, Canada, and K.U. Menon, India, to go and do this. They were senior secretary officials. By the time they came, the offer by Kenya had been elaborated, was ready, and the uh, the, I met the team at the airport, the foreign minister met them, the finance minister met them, environment minister met, we met, agreed, they were agreeable, they want, so whatever they could see, and it was time for them to go back. And our letter to the Secretary General was over, and I followed to New York, then the matter resumed. And at the resumption, Kenya now and India were talking. There was a, an understanding, more or less an understanding it would, India would not insist. And then that morning in the committee, the, uh, uh, the Indian whispered to Kenya, they have withdrawn. So what next? Chairman uh, of uh, 77, we approach, he said, let us adjourn for 10 minutes to facilitate, to, to, we may come up with a decision that would facilitate the work of the committee. 10 minutes, brief, yes. Any object, none, granted. They, as soon as all these other countries except uh, the 77 and China left, first speaker, Indian ambassador said that uh, he is, uh, he ha wants to assure, tell the committee that uh, India has withdrawn in favor of Kenya because of the brotherly relations and all that. And so they are not running. Whoa. Next speaker, Ambassador of Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. In solidarity, we are together. And then he suggests Chairman of the Group of 77, Ambassador Abdul Magid of the Arab Republic of Egypt, uh, proposes an amendment now putting operative paragraph two to the resolution, you know, which would then say, father decides to locate the secretariat in Nairobi, Kenya stop. And you imagine that was said at dictation speed and at normal speed. Can you imagine <laughs> Mine, that kind of minor, uh, 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 minor adjustment then that was agreed. The committee comes back. Now, chairman of the group of 77, what has happened that would be to facilitate the work of the group? That is what was coming on. And there would be then voting on, a, on, a, on a one paragraph, by the way, operative paragraph one, because some countries did not know what a developing country was. So on that question, on that question, by recorded vote, there was that vote. And it was by 93 votes in favor, none against, no abstention. You know, you, you know you, you, 93 in favor, one against in the second committee and 30 abstentions. Of course, the rest of the property paragraph two was a given now 
because it's already agreed where. And having done that, on the 15th of December, two weeks later, in the plenary, the resolution support that we talked of, we, Kenya, we drafted, was now put before the vote. And by 128 votes, no abstention, no negative vote, the resolution was unanimous. I noted one country, because I was on the Kenyan seat doing all this good work there, pressing the, the button, they did not express a vote, but there it was. 128-00, and history was there, and then made. Then and now, the fourth headquarters of the United Nations is and was established in Nairobi, Kenya, stop. And that is my story on that particular topic.